Hi, I'm James Catherall, founder of Catherall Audio, and today I want to discuss one of the most controversial topics currently in DCI, and that's placing wireless microphones on select members of the brass section to amplify it through the sound system. I want to help answer some questions and shed some light on what goes into this type of approach and hopefully inform everyone on the work that goes into making it happen successfully on the field. If you've followed the activity for a while, you've no doubt noticed the exponential growth of electronics use. Just 10 years ago, cores only had two speaker stacks, one on the left side and one on the right side to create a stereo image along with one or two subwoofers. They were using prosumer level digital mixers that were in the range of $1,500 to $2,000. They were placing mics on mallet instruments with a couple hardwired mics on the front sideline for soloists and at most two or three wireless mics for select soloists in the show. From there, things quickly exploded and groups added two or four more speaker stacks along the front sideline for a total of six stacks. They moved from point source speakers to line arrays, added more subwoofers, they started acquiring more professional level mixers that range from $10,000 to $15,000. They started using mostly wireless mics for soloists through the show. And what at the time was controversial was adding what are referred to as field mics along the front sideline. These were usually either shotgun microphones or a pair of small diaphragm condenser mics placed in an XY configuration. Then that led to the next big step of progress and that's where we are now. Adding wireless mics to individual players in the ensemble and having them turned on for most or all of the show. To start, let's talk about the most common philosophy behind adding these extra mics into the show. We'll focus on the pros and cons of field mics and individual wireless brass mics. Starting with field mics, the pros. They're relatively affordable in the grand scheme of electronic purchases for a drum corps. I won't go too deep into that yet because we'll talk more about the finances in a bit. Next, they're a bit easier to balance the audio than wireless mics because they're picking up a localized range of instruments and boosting the volume. So essentially, it's just taking the acoustic balance that the ensemble has been developing and it amplifies it. It's not too difficult to set up and manage at shows or throughout the season. It's basically just adding a couple more items to bring in and plug in during your setup. And it isn't too difficult to manage turning them on and off, especially if your ensemble uses main stage along with it. You won't necessarily need a large audio team to be able to set up and manage field mics during the show or throughout the season. As far as cons, you have to design the visual package with the field mics in mind from the very beginning to get the most effective use out of them. They really only work when you're in a somewhat close proximity to them. The farther away the players are from the mic, the less effective they can be. Next, it does add some balancing difficulty if specific members of the ensemble are really close and others are really far away. For example, if your low brass is really close and the high brass is further back field, then the low brass will be amplified much louder through the sound system. So you'll need to keep that in mind when balancing the ensemble. It can also present balance problems if you're wanting to use the field mics during a moment where the wind players are moving around a lot because you'll get hot spots in the mix as different players move in and out of the proximity of the microphone. Also, it can pick up undesirable sounds such as color guard counting out loud or dropping equipment, or it'll pick up the battery, which is typically already the loudest part of the ensemble. And it's also susceptible to wind noise, which can be mitigated by wind screens, but it can still come through if it's an especially windy day. Now, let's talk about the philosophy behind using wireless brass mics on individual players. Contrary to popular belief, it's not necessarily about making your brass as loud as jet engines. When I've talked with other audio engineers, the philosophy is very similar to why we place mics on mallet instruments. It allows the players to focus on being more musical and play with better sounds, rather than just blasting air through their horn to create drama or impact. This is especially true with soloists. Another thing to keep in mind is that instruments sound different when played at different volumes. The timbre of a trumpet is different when played at piano compared to fortissimo. A piano note isn't simply a soft forte note, it actually creates a different style of sound from the instrument. So placing a mic on a soloist can allow you to still have a more intimate style of tone while still being heard. And this can allow for more orchestrational depth 
because you can have other members of the ensemble play accompanying parts without fear that it'll cover the soloist. Mallet players went through a similar phase before amplification was allowed. They typically had to play with harder, brighter mallets and play with a harder touch on the instrument just to be heard. Now we can teach mallet players a more concert style approach that is more in line with what other professionals do outside of the activity. Other pros of wireless mics include the ability to have more control over what's being amplified on the field since you aren't just picking up a general area around the mic. You don't need to worry as much about picking up guard counts or battery beats. Now, the cons of wireless mics. First off, the most obvious one is the cost. Getting enough wireless mics for a drum corps is really costly, especially when making sure that you get the right gear. Wireless equipment is something that you do not want to go cheap on. Managing the wireless equipment during rehearsals and at shows is also a mammoth of a task. Just to give a general idea of what purely goes into just managing the equipment itself so that it can be ready to go at shows and at rehearsals. First, you'll want to have all the wireless equipment connected to a network that's also connected to a computer. This allows you to control all the devices from your computer. Most groups use Wireless Workbench to manage and monitor all their wireless devices. This is where you'll scan and coordinate the wireless frequencies, which you'll need to do every time the ensemble travels to a new location, because you need to make sure you're not trying to use the same frequencies as any of the broadcast television in the area, as well as any other radio frequencies that are being used. After that's done, then you need to hand the mics out to all the players and make sure they know how to attach the body pack to their instrument, and that the microphone is placed correctly so that you can get the right sound you want. Finally, you'll need to monitor the battery levels through rehearsal because the body packs can burn through the battery pretty quickly. And depending on how many devices you're using, you'll probably end up changing them pretty often throughout rehearsal. Wireless mics can often be viewed as an easy win mode for groups that use them, but it's far from simple to utilize them correctly. If done poorly, it can hurt you much more than it benefits you. I already brought up some of the difficulties in just managing the equipment itself, but you also have to be very meticulous about balancing them and turning them on and off through the show. Cores will spend large amounts of time building scenes into their digital mixers that will change the levels of the wireless mics at key points of the show, as well as dialing in the EQ so that the mics can sound good coming through the speakers. They also work on panning the mics so that the sound coming from the speakers matches where the performer is placed on the field. You also have to create input delays on the digital mixer based off of the placement of the performer on the field because the sound from the mic will often reach the speaker sooner than the acoustic sound of the instrument, which can make everything sound muddy. So they need to calculate the placement on the field and what the delay will need to be in milliseconds and input that into the mixer settings. With all of those things in mind, using wireless mics in this fashion is not something that should be done by a group with a small staff. You need large teams of people to be able to pull all of this off successfully or else it'll just hurt your group instead of helping them. So now I wanna go over what the costs of all of this will typically look like. We'll first talk about field mics because that's the more popular approach among drum corps and high school marching bands right now. You'll need four things for a proper field mic setup. First is the stand. You'll want something sturdy so that it won't blow over in the wind or get knocked down if someone accidentally bumps it. A common one is the K&M 20,800. That costs $172 per stand. Second, when it comes to mics, there are a few different options. You can buy a shotgun mic like the Rode NTG-1, which costs $249 per mic. Or you can do the dual small diaphragm condenser mics like the Rode NT5, which costs $429 for a stereo matched pair. The last popular option is the Shure VP88, which costs $799 per mic. Third, you'll need a windscreen, which will differ depending on the mic you use, but a popular option for the shotgun mics or VP88 is the Rode Blimp, which costs $299.
Fourth, you'll need cables that are long enough to reach your mixer or snake, which will most likely be 50 or 100 feet. For now, we'll go with 50 foot XLRs, which will cost $32 each. This brings it up to a total of between $752 and $1,334 per field mic that you use, and groups typically use between three and five field mics. Now let's compare that to a wireless mic setup. I'm gonna give an example of a lower end system cost-wise. You'll need four things for this setup. First is the wireless receiver and body pack transmitter. I'll stick with Sure gear. The lowest you'll wanna go with is the QLXD4 line, which will be $999 each. Second, you'll need a microphone. The standard for brass mics is the Shure Beta 98HC, which is $169 per mic. Third, you'll need the power distributor. You need one of these for every four QLXD4 receivers you're using. These cost $614 each. Lastly, you'll need the UA874 antenna. You'll only need two of these for the whole system, so that'll cost $808. It seems that the common approach is to do two mics per part in the core, so that would range from around 18 to 22 mics. We'll go with the low end of 18, so that would bring this total to $24,920. Now, looking at that number is definitely scary. This method is not cheap by any means. This is probably the heart of the controversy because obviously not every group can afford this and it can make it feel like it's a pay to win type of situation. And honestly, it's hard to disagree with that, but it's not just wireless mics that create that atmosphere in drum corps. You can also pay to win with the largest, most awesome props that anyone's ever seen or by paying to have the strongest, most experienced design team. There's a strong correlation between core's budgets and competitive placement just like you'd see in a pro sport like baseball. The point being that it's not just wireless microphones that create this divide. It's a much larger conversation that I'd say is outside the scope of this video. The last part of this discussion is regulation. I put up a poll to see if people feel there should be restrictions on wireless mics and DCI, and I was actually a bit surprised the vast majority said no. But let's back up a bit and understand how rules are brought about in DCI. It isn't some outside overseeing group that places regulations on drum corps and tells them what to do. Any rules that currently exist were voted in by the corps themselves. Every two years, the drum corps can propose new rule changes and then everyone meets in January and discusses all of the proposals and then each corps votes on whether the rule should pass or not. So any rule that is currently in place exists because the majority of the cores themselves wanted them in place. And rules to regulate wireless brass mics have been proposed and so far they haven't passed. This doesn't mean that it won't ever happen. The rule can be proposed again in the future, but there's something to keep in mind. For the rule to have any meaning, it would have to have a clear way of being enforced. And that doesn't seem possible at the moment in my opinion. This would require extra resources from DCI to provide someone at each show, and sometimes there can be up to four or five shows in a single day. And that person is connected to a direct feed from the core mixer and trained to know what they're listening for to make sure that cores are properly following the rules. And that would be a big increase in cost for the operation of each show and anything outside of that type of enforcement would make the passage of those rules essentially meaningless. So to recap all of this, cores will continue to explore ways to enhance their shows through the use of electronics, and some will be more successful at the execution of that than others. It can be a costly decision to add individual wireless mics and can add a lot of work onto the plate of the audio team. But at the end of the day, just like many other creative decisions, spending more money won't automatically make the show more competitively successful or, more importantly, more enjoyable. The most important focus for all cores is to create an engaging show that the performers and the audience will enjoy. That's it for this video. If you enjoyed it, I'd really appreciate it if you gave it a like and also click that subscribe button. And I'll see you in the next one.